Africans, and I want justice for people worldwide, but here's the thing about Pan-Africanism, Brother Rock. Pan-Africanism, if we're going to be honest, as a whole, it has always been one-sided. We have been the ones pushing the Pan-African line as a collective. Yes, you might get a Garvey. Yes, you might get a Stokely Carmichael. These are outliers from those communities. We've been the only ones doing that. Even now, in some of these Caribbean and African nations, they're so tribal over there, they can't really get it together with each other there. Yeah, we back. Come on, Tariq. Look, I don't even get paid for this, bro. Certain information is so exclusive that I feel like it got to be behind a paywall. You know what I mean? It got to be exclusive for the people. But you just say so much nonsense that needs to be debunked that I got to pull out the government documents. I got to pull out letters from like 1817. I got to pull out exclusive stuff that you never seen. Bro, listen, it is what it is, bro. Tariq Nasheed, as we know, he said that hashtag FBA, the political group that he created from his basement, was the spearhead behind Pan-Africanism. And if that wasn't blasphemous enough, he also also said pan-africanism has only gone in one direction meaning that black americans have only been the ones practicing pan-africanism they've been the one at the tip of pan-africanism at the head of pan-africanism so today we have to just politely debunk it today i'm not even here for the jokes the roast you know sometimes i like to throw my little jabs at tariq you know what i mean but nah today i'm just coming with the information the facts the photos the government documents the letters that were written by government ministers i'm just coming with the facts top to bottom and then you can come with your facts you can reply but you probably won't because after today it's best that you probably just ignore me because this is going to be the debunking of all debunkings now if you saw my channel two days ago i just debunked this other haitian shake for spreading lies and false propaganda on the image of the black man now i gotta debunk you again i gotta give you the same treatment now let's jump into it not wasting no time i'm gonna start in chronological order starting from the year 1804 all the way until 1955. I'm pulling out official government letters written by Dessaline himself, Christophe himself, Boyer himself. I was chilling in bed last night and I seen that clip where you said that FBA are the pioneers of Pan-Africanism. And I swear to God, bro, you made me jump out of bed. I was up all night stockpiling information, stockpiling photos. Bro, today is gonna be a legendary day. And I want you to watch to the end of this video. And after today, Tariq, just please, bro, go back to talking about reparations. Go back to talking about the Democrat Party. But leave black immigrants out your mouth. Leave Pan-Africanism out your mouth. Now, today, the first letter we're going to jump into is a letter written by the honorable, the illustrious, the legendary General Jean-Jacques Dessalines himself. Let's jump into it. Liberty or death. Government of Haiti. The first year of independence. The governor general. Considering that a great number of native blacks and men of color are suffering in the United States of America for want of the means of returning, decrees there shall be allowed to the captains of American vessels the sum of $40 for each individual they may restore to this country. He orders that this decree shall be printed, published, and posted up, and that a copy thereof be immediately forwarded to the Congress of the United States by the Governor General, signed, Dessalines. Now keep in mind, during that time, I don't know why, but for some reason, the S was switched up with the F. So I don't know, man. When you read documents from this era, early 1800s sometimes, you see the S with the F. Don't worry, man. Just let's get back into it. Like I said, I ain't coming here for the jokes. I ain't coming here to roast. I'm coming straight with the information and I'm gone, man. Because listen, they do not pay me for this. Matter of fact, listen, get in the description box. Show some support for your boy, man. Because listen, we cooking this man. We cooking this man, bro. I just spent all night compiling information. And bro, today is going to be a funeral service. That's all I'm going to say. Let's get back into it. Prince Saunders was an African-American teacher, scholar, diplomat, and author who different sources say was born in either Lebanon, Connecticut, or Thetford, Vermont. During his life, Saunders helped set up schools for African-Americans in Massachusetts and also in Haiti for King Henry Christophe. During his time in Haiti, Saunders also penned the Haitian papers, which were a translation of the Haitian laws with his commentary. He was a proponent of black immigration to Haiti, where he became a naturalized citizen. Because of his influence in establishing schools for African-Americans, Saunders was one of the most significant black educators in the early 19th century in the United States and in Haiti. He lived his last days in Port-au-Prince, where he died in 1839. Now, listen, Wikipedia should never be used as a primary source, all right? You need to get direct sources, literature that actually has credibility. The danger about studying black history on Wikipedia is that when you look in their reference section, when they talk about the literature that the information came from, you'll notice that most of their literature, especially regarding topics of black history, it comes from white men. So Wikipedia is going to give you information written by white men. So that is the danger. You got to get direct sources from the people of that nation. Wikipedia should only be used for basic summarization. All right, let's get back into it. 
Upon Saunders' arrival to Haiti, he began working as an advisor for Christophe. Saunders impressed the king by his striking Negro features, manners, and remarkable education. Because Christophe considered Saunders to be the face of black accomplishment, Saunders later became Christophe's official courier. During his reign as king in Haiti, Christophe had to battle with mulatto domination and the influence of former French settlers on the island. The French believed that intellectually, blacks were inferior to their white counterparts. To counter this, Christophe wanted to set up a school in Haiti which he believed would disprove the French theory. To Christophe, Saunders was the perfect man for the job, as not only was he adept in running schools and teaching, but he also was black, which meant a successful school system would reflect positively for the blacks on the island. Saunders made several trips back and forth between Haiti and London. On those trips, Saunders brought back smallpox vaccination in addition to four Lancasterian teachers that helped in creating the Royal College of Haiti and Cap Henry. In return, Christophe gave the schools furnishing that was equivalent to what could be found in London at the time. Now, hold up. Before we go any further, I want to jump back to that first slide, right? That letter from Dessaline. $40 in the year 1804, that was about over a little over $1,000, right? So basically, Dessaline said, yo, I got a rack for every black person in the United States, bro. I got a rack each. Let me know what's popping. Now, of course, you know, the racist white boys in, the white, in America, they were like, what? We ain't selling our property to you, N-word. You know what I mean? Like, they wasn't going to sell the property. But yeah, Dessaline had that bag. He was like, bro, I got a thousand. What up, bro? I got a thousand for each black man and woman. What's popping, bro? What up? You know what I mean? But, you know, it is what it is, man. Let's jump back into it. Prince Saunders authored the Haitian papers for the British people who had a negative view of Haiti in order to give them some much more correct information of the Haitian government and to throw light on the new and much improved condition of all classes of society in that kingdom. He believed it was only fair and necessary that the feelings of the Haitians should be made evident. The history of Haiti had previously been written not by the Haitians themselves, but by white Europeans who did not understand the law. The Haitian papers were from the views of colored people without a drop of white European blood in them. Hey, man. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, listen, you want to talk about who was spearheading Pan-Africanism? Listen, 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 Tariq, listen, just please stop lying on the people, man. That's all I'm going to ask. After this video, please stop lying on the people because the information I'm going to come with is going to be, bro, after this, ain't no debating, bro, ain't no debate. Only thing you're going to say is like, oh, uh, oh, yeah, well, your mama, your mama, I was, uh, your mama was in the motel, you know what I mean? Yeah, you tether, you tether. No, but I'm coming with the, doc the, the real documents, bro. So, listen, just stop lying on the people. That's all I could ask. Let's jump back into it. Oh, and by the way, when has an FBA ever put up a thousand per stack to bring somebody in to give them citizenship in their own country and inaugurated them into the political ruling class of that society? Listen, we opened doors for black Americans to reach levels of success and power that were currently unavailable in their country of origin, bro. You cannot be no attorney general. You cannot be no political diplomat. You cannot be no global ambassador. You cannot be doing international business, sailing between London and Haiti and setting up schools and, and achieving all these extravagant things in the year 1812, bro. You cannot. It wasn't possible in the United States, bro. It wasn't possible. We opened them doors. We opened them doors for our brothers from different locations. And then you turn around and say, oh, it was hashtag FBA. That, come on, bro. Just stop lying on the people, man. You don't got to just make up lies to push your brand and sell T-shirts and sell DVDs. It's never that serious, bro. It's never that serious man you don't got to do all that just to sell a product bro i know we all got bills to pay i know you just had a baby but please bro come on man i know you owe taxes but come on bro you don't got to just lie on our forefathers just because you got bills to pay come on let's have some honor and integrity for once in your life i understand that's a foreign language to you but please bro come on stop let's jump back into it Having spent much time in Haiti working under King Christophe, Saunders became familiar with the country, which led him to see Haiti as a viable option for black emigration. Saunders saw Haiti as the paradise of the new world, which he drew from its situation, extent, climate, and fertility suited to become an object of interest and attention. Now, of course, for those of y'all that listened to my audiobook that I put out last month called The Most Powerful Black Man of the Last 500 Years, where we discussed life during the reign of King Henry Christophe from the year 1802 to 1820. Go check that out after this video right now. Listen. Under the regime, under the administration of Christoph, Haiti seen levels of success that it has never seen ever since he died. Let's get back into it. After Christoph's death, biographer Harold Van Buren Voorhis claimed that Saunders was made attorney general by Haiti's new president, Jean-Pierre Boyer. Saunders then lived most of his remaining life in Haiti before he died in Port-au-Prince on January 22nd, 1839. Now listen, where could you become a black attorney general in the United States in the 1800s, bro? Let's see when was the first attorney general in 
FBA territory in the United States. Let's see when that was, all right? And then you can see when the first black man from America became attorney general in Haiti because the black Haitian man opened the door for his brother to become a political dignitary, a political figure, you know, a wealthy millionaire working in government, interfacing with the various European powers. Because Prince Saunders was traveling the world. He was, he was skating all over Europe. He was running all over Europe, right? On behalf of the Haitian government. So where could you do that in the United States? Let's see when the first attorney general from the United States happened, right? Remember, General Jean-Pierre Baye became president in 1825. He elected Prince Saunders, attorney general of his administration. Now let's see when the first black man in America became attorney general. Let's do it. Eric Holder Jr., an American lawyer who served as the 82nd attorney general. That means it was like 80 white boys then served in the position before a single light-skinned black man could even get in the seat, all right? Meanwhile, a black American man was already attorney general damn near two centuries ago back in Haiti, you know what I mean, doing his thing. But anyways, let's jump back into it, you know. An American lawyer who served as the 82nd attorney general of the United States from 2009. So y'all had to wait 2009, bro. Y'all got here 1619, had to wait till 2009. But the black man in Haiti opened the door for his brother like, bro come through bro come through let's get this money bro get in government let's run a country bro let's build a nation bro let's do it man we free bro we we got them chains off our backs bro let's get to it man let's let's get it man you know what i mean that was the energy back in them days man but you had to wait till 2009 bro you had to wait over 150 years later damn near 200 years later 80 white boys served in the position before Eric Holder, and he light-skinned. It's like Obama. Y'all had to wait like over 200 years for a black president, and his mama was white. You know what I mean? Yo. So, Tariq, what do you mean that you were spearheading Pan-Africanism? What do you mean, bro? What do you mean? Haitian men don't even say we spearhead Pan-Africanism. And we really spearheaded Pan-Africanism. We don't even brag and, 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 and let our nuts hang like that, bro. Like, we actually got credentials to back it up, bro. We got weight in the game, bro. We done, Like, what are you talking about, bro? Bro, we done put up so many points on the scoreboard. The only thing I ask, just stop lying to the people, bro. Stop lying to the people. You don't got to make up lies to sell t-shirts, bro. Just make a cool t-shirt and they'll just buy it because it looks good. You don't got to lie as the marketing campaign, bro. You don't got to lie. I know you got to gas up your audience like, yo, we're so amazing. We the illest. We the greatest. Now give me your money. Buy my t-shirt. Buy my sneakers. Buy my shoes. But please, bro, you don't got to. Bro, come on, bro. I know you treat your audience like a girl, like a girl. Yo, you're so beautiful, baby. You know what I'm saying? Yo, man, you a beautiful creature. You know, I see you from across the room and you just took my breath away. I didn't even know what to do no more. You know, I just had to say what's up with you. And, you know, can I get your number? Can I get your Snapchat? Can I get your Instagram? What's popping? Yeah, my name is Tariq. Yeah, Tariq. Yeah, Tariq Nasheed. Yeah, yeah. All right, baby. Yeah, I'm gonna hit you up on Instagram. All right, all right. Peace. Yeah, buy my T-shirt. www.fba. All right, peace. Take my card. Yo, bro, you don't gotta just lie to people, bro. You don't gotta just lie. Just have a good product and put it out on the market, and the market will decide. Let's get back into it. When Clarkson heard from an American friend of a project to send free people of color from the United States to Haiti, he saw another opportunity to be of service. He pointed out to Christoph the substantial advantages of increasing his population by these immigrants from the United States. They would assist materially in introducing the English language into the kingdom of Haiti, and since many of them were skilled workers, they would prove useful by their example. Clarkson also wrote to Richard Peters, the president of the Triennial Convention a congress of various abolition societies in the United States, urging him to send delegates to Haiti for the purpose of investigating the conditions there. Nor was this all. He suggested that the United States might be prevailed upon to purchase Spanish Santo Domingo as an asylum for free American Negroes, and then to cede it to Christoph. Such an arrangement would both enlarge Christoph's territory and enhance his reputation abroad. Nothing came of Clarkson's hopes. A revolution in Spain put an end to any chance of selling Santo Domingo, but it is extremely unlikely that the United States would have considered such an arrangement, with a black king, of course. Yet Christoph received Clarkson's suggestions and wrote through Limonade to American abolitionists, offering to defray the cost of the Negro immigrants, whom he was willing to receive without any stipulation regarding the Spanish part of the island. Now, pause right there. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Tariq, I know it feels crazy being referred to as an immigrant, right? But yes, you you guys were the Negro immigrants back in the year 1819. You guys, yes, the FBA, y'all were known as the, the Negro immigrants because the black man down in Haiti, yeah, the black man down in Haiti, he was having money, he was having jewelry, he was having ice, he was having property, he was having land, he was having government, he was having armies, he was having navies, he was having military, he was having women, he was having everything he needed, everything he wanted in the year 1819. And guess what? The brothers in America, they wanted a piece of the pot too, and we had our arms open. We were willing to put money down for our brothers to come enjoy with what we accomplished, bro. With what we accomplished, we were willing to put our money up, the government, state, 
money we were like yo bro we'll put the money up just for our brothers to come through and live a better life with us bro a place where we could live free and in peace away from our european enemies and then you got the nerve to turn around and say oh those people from those societies it was just one or two people you know it was just little outliers here and there bro people were putting up hundreds of thousands of dollars bro when you adjust for inflation it was like hundreds of thousands millions of dollars being put up so our brothers can come through bro what are you talking about money we could have invested in agriculture education construction bro we could have put that money to good use we could have put that money towards nation building and for each example i bring up i just want you to give me the fba equivalent give me the fba equivalent of the haitian man that came to the united states and the black american man was able to install him in government tell me when the black american man back in the year 1819 was willing to put up over twenty five thousand dollars per family for his brother coming through so he can start a new life and become a citizen in his domain tell me where that was possible in the united states in that year tell me when it was ever possible tell it tell me when it was ever accomplished in reverse bro every example i want you to give me you make a video bring it up in return meaning i brought up the black american attorney general in the year 1825 pan-africanism all right so you give me the black american that installed a haitian or a, a tether or a jamaican or a nigerian into political office in the year 1825 Give me the direct example. Tell me when you return the favor, right? Everything I bring up, tell me when you return the favor since you are the spearhead of Pan-Africanism, okay? Let's do that. Let's get back into it. Offering to defray the cost of transportation for the Negro immigrants whom he was willing to receive without any stipulation regarding the Spanish part of the island. Now stop right there. The reason why he said he would receive the Negro immigrants from black America without any stipulation of the Spanish part of the island because this letter was written by Thomas Clarkson. As we know, Thomas Clarkson, world famous British abolitionist, diplomat, British elite, you know, big time, big chief up in London, right? So he wrote this letter to King Henry Christophe, right? You know, the black man back in the year 1819, you know, he was, you know, interfacing with European powers and world governments, you know what I'm saying? Checking millions of dollars back in them days, man. So, you know, Thomas Clarkson being an abolitionist, he was connected with the abolition societies up in America, right? So he was trying to interface with the world powers to say, okay, King Henry Christophe is willing to receive these immigrants and pay the cost, but we want to give him kickbacks. We want to give him a benefit in the deal. So Thomas Clarkson was like, yo, we could probably negotiate with the United States. They could, you know, conquer the Spanish part of the island and they could sell it to you. Now, of course, that was a long shot. Why would they sell half of that Hispaniola to a black man? You know, they don't even see black men as human beings back then. So obviously it never happened. But Thomas Clarkson was trying to, you know what I mean? You know how the government works. You got to, you know, give kickbacks, benefits. But Christoph, being such an honorable man, he was like, yo, I'll receive them with no stipulation of the Spanish part of the island. I don't even need that part of the island i'll pay i'll put money down let my brothers come through let's get it popping bro bring them over there you know what i'm saying so listen you talking about pan-africanism tell me when you did the equivalent everything i bring up i want the fba equivalent in return to the quote-unquote tethers right everything the tethers did for the fba i want you to give me where the fba did the equivalent bro i'm talking about in the money the sacrifice the prestige the positions all that bro i want you to give me the direct comparison let's get back into it there were many thousands of the free people of color who wished to go to Haiti, but the death of Christophe prevented the signing of an agreement whereby he was to provide a vessel to transport them and to advance $25,000 as a first donation towards incidental expenses. So just taking a trip to Haiti, he'll pay the cost and once you come through, you have $25,000 dollars waiting for you bro now let's do the modern equivalent of that because as you know twenty five thousand dollars in the year 1820 was not you know twenty five thousand dollars it is today bro we have to see what that value was bro hold on right now hold, hold on hold on hold on hold on we have to see man we have to see twenty five thousand dollars in 1820 modern equivalent to today would be six hundred thirty four thousand two hundred and five dollars and thirteen cents so basically christoph said yo come to haiti i got over 600 racks waiting for you bro 600 racks for each family bro for them thousands of families i got 600 racks for each of them thousands of families bro yeah, that's the type of money that Christoph was playing with back in them days. I told you, when Christoph died, they found over $6 million in the palace and over $10 billion inside the Citadel, that mountaintop fortress. Yes, they did. So listen, man, tell me the modern equivalent where a FBA was going to give each Tether family over $600,000 just for showing up on the shores of America. Silence. That's what I hear. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Man, get in the description right now. Hit the cash app. Blow the cash app. Listen, listen. I done been up all night, bro. I ain't slept in like 26 hours. Bro, listen. After I upload this video, I'm going straight to sleep. You know what I'm saying? Get in the cash app. Donate to your boy. Listen, we got to debunk the propaganda out in these streets bro come on man these t-shirt salesmen just out here spreading false lies bro we got to treat this like anti-semitism bro let's get back into it 
mention should be made of Prince Saunders, an American Negro. He was born in New England and attended Moore's Charity School at Dartmouth College in 1807 and 1808. Saunders' activity on behalf of the less fortunate members of his own race won him friendship of several influential Americans who sent him to England with numerous letters of recommendation. At the suggestion of the English abolitionists, he came to Haiti to assist in organizing the schools and to forward the cause of Protestantism. He became almost at once a rabid follower of Christoph and determined to make known the integrity of the king's character and the enlightened nature of the government. In 1816, he published the Haitian papers in London and two years later reissued the book in Boston. It is said that Sanders introduced vaccination into Haiti and personally vaccinated Christoph's children. Now tell me the equivalent, bro. Tell me the equivalent to the level of Pan-Africanism that was preached by the black Haitian man back in the year 1816, bro. Tell me, tell me when, tell me when, bro. Tell me when, tell me when. Like I said, bro, after today, please don't ever bring up Pan-Africanism ever again in your life unless you're paying homage, all right? Unless you're trying to pay homage, I'm not trying to hear it. Keep Pan-Africanism out your mouth. Keep black immigrants out your mouth. Let's get back into it. We're going to start at the bottom where I got it highlighted. Now, this is a letter written by King Henry Christoph himself, as you can see, to Thomas Clarkson, British diplomat, British abolitionist. And the part I highlighted says... Though it is only with the greatest grief that I can bear to see Spanish vessels engaged in the slave trade with inside of our coast. It is not my intention to fit out ships of war against them because I should never wish to give our enemies any excuse of molesting us. You are aware that they watch each and our every action and that nothing would make them happier than to find some way of discrediting us in the eyes of the world. Christoph wrote to the British government telling them, bro, I'm over here, bro. Every damn day I'm waking up. I'm drinking my rum. I'm smoking my cigar. I'm up in the citadel. I look across the coast. I look across the harbor. You know, I got my Navy patrolling the sea, but at the same time, I'm seeing slave ships still pulling up to the Dominican Republic dropping off black men women and children and to be honest bro I'm ready to I'm ready to hop up in the damn warship and I'm ready to go to war but you know if I go to war I know that's gonna have the media in a frenzy you know I'm, I know that's gonna have Europe in a frenzy they're gonna be like man that boy Christoph down in the island you know what I'm saying he causing trouble so you know what should I do what should I do yo so listen this is what the black man back in the 1819 1818 1820 was talking about and doing bro he was talking about fitting out ships of war to intercept and rescue enslaved men women and children from European slave vessels bro tell me the FBA equivalent Tell me, bro. Tell me. Tell me. Bro, please stop talking about Pan-Africanism, bro. Please. Please. This is my expertise. Let's get back into it. This is a letter from Thomas Clarkson to King Henry Christoph. Let's jump right into it. Not wasting no time, man. Today is going to be an epic debunking session like no other. Having just received a letter from a friend of mine in the United States of America, I'm desirous of making you acquainted with his contents. It appears that letter that there is a great number of free people of color settled in different parts of the United States. I believe their number may amount to about 200,000. They live chiefly by their industry and many of them have acquired property. There has been a general wish among the citizens of the United States that they should be sent to Africa, the land of their ancestors, to live there as the independent people, either under the protection of the American government or under a guarantee of the different powers of Europe, that they shall not be molested there. But of late, this opinion has changed and there seems to now be a desire that they should be sent to Haiti, provided they should wish to emigrate there and provided that your majesty and general Boyer would have no objection to receive them and to take them under your protection many meetings have been held by the friends of the abolition in the united states and are still to be held there to take into consideration this important subject i have thought it proper therefore to advise your majesty of these circumstances that in case any application should be made to you for this purpose you may be put upon your guard there can be no doubt that such an immigration if it consisted of persons of character would very much add to your population and of course to the security of your dominion but there is another point of view in which it might be far more advantageous if the american government were to apply to you on this subject you might stipulate to receive them provided the american government would purchase the spanish part of the island and cede it to you but upon no other terms i am told that the spanish ambassador to the united states is of opinion that his own government would dispose of this part of the island for this purpose spain would probably sell it to america though she would not sell it to your majesty should such an event take place it would take away one great cause of uneasiness from you you would then have no fear of france either by a direct invasion of haiti or by the settlement of frenchmen on the spanish part of the island i do not know whether this project of taking the free people of color to haiti will ever come to anything but yet i thought it proper to apprise you of it i feel myself obliged to your majesty for desiring the count of limonade to inform me to the death of prince noel because i always take an interest in what may concern you i am with great respect and regard your majesty his friend Thomas Clarkson. Since writing the above, I've had some conversations with Mr. Wilberforce, who is of the opinion that you should not refuse to receive the free people of color from the United States, provided the government of the United States would buy the Spanish part of the island for that purpose. I am very glad that Prince Saunders has been impressing the citizens of North America with the most favorable idea of your majesty's character, both at Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and other parts, which has caused them to turn their attention towards you. Now, hold up, listen, I could be childish, but because I respect the legacy and the accomplishments and the image of my forefathers, 
I'm not gonna do it, but I gotta do it a little bit, bro. When they came to Kristoff with the idea that black Americans wanted to find a better place to live, a more peaceful place to live, Kristoff did not insult them and say that they were a bunch of fleers and cowards and oh you fleeing and you want to come to what i built and what i came and i fought for and i died for you wasn't there in 1803 and go naive you wasn't there in 1802 and cut that war you wasn't there in 1795 against the british you wasn't there in 1791 against the french you wasn't there in 1794 against the spanish like they didn't say none of that bro they just said bro you my brother i love you come through you a black man you a black woman bring your wife bring your kids let's go bro let's go bro i got the bread i got the bag it don't don't even worry about nothing bro when you come through i got 600 racks waiting for you bro don't even worry about nothing come through we didn't say you were a coward we didn't say why don't you stay and fight we overthrew our oppressor we overthrew our colonial government why you running why you running huh why you running to what we built you want to uh, oh you want to leech off what we built huh oh you running oh you want to come to the kingdom of haiti oh you running are you fleeing oh you don't want to stay and overthrow the american colonial structure oh oh you waited for the you waited for the black man to pave the way you waited for the black man to give you the red carpet so you can come and be a tether and tether to our greatness oh bro no no we didn't say that bro we didn't say that we didn't say that we didn't say that you saw in the book the british government was offering the whole damn dominican republic over to christoph just to persuade him to accept the offer and he was like yo bro keep that part of the island i'll put up the money myself 600 racks for each family i'll pay the cost for the boat i'll pay the cost for transportation i'll pay the cost for incidental expenses bringing the homies through and you turn around and say that you were the spearhead of pan-africanism and the tethers are leeching off of you and the tethers need to pay homage and bow down because you guys are the vanguard and the revolutionaries and the front man and you got to face the black people around the world bro listen after today after today, I don't want to hear nothing else. Matter of fact, everybody watching this, share this everywhere. Share this on Twitter. Share this on YouTube. Share this on Facebook. Share this on Instagram. Share this everywhere. Share this on a web forum. Share it everywhere. Share it on Google Hangout. Share it, bro. Share, share, share. Get into the description box. Hit the cash app. Hit the cash app. Listen. Oh, my God, bro. Oh, my God, bro. I am a legend. All right. Let's get back into it. <laughs> Let's get back into it, bro. This is a legendary debunking. I thought the debunking I did a few days ago against that angry female was legendary, but man, today is going to surpass that by miles. Let's jump back into it, man. Now on this one, this is a letter from King Henry Christoph, as you can see, written July 29th, 1819, but we're going to start at the bottom paragraph. We're not going to read the whole thing. I read attentively your remarks concerning the emigration of colored people from the United States of America and appreciate fully what you say about the advantage and disadvantage which might result. Approaches have been made to me from the United States by several persons, in particular by the Emancipation Society of New York. I have replied only to the letter and I'm sending you a copy so that you may know my views on this subject. So listen, man, listen, we didn't say, oh, them boys out of America, they fleeing. Oh, they, oh, oh, they don't want to, they don't want, they don't want to take up arms against the government like we did. No, we didn't say that, bro. We didn't say that, bro. We didn't say that. Why? Because, you know, we were men of honor and integrity and, you know, we actually were not, you know, cowards and we actually were not childish and we actually had a government to run. We actually had to, you know, establish government and laws and structure for our people. So we cannot sit around cracking jokes and roasting on YouTube and Twitter spaces back in the year 1819. But let's jump back into it. Now, keep in mind, I said I would go in chronological order. We started back in 1804. Now, we are still in 1820 and we are not even halfway through the information that i've stockpiled all night we are still in 1820 and all of this has happened in a 15 year period so listen give me a 15 year period where fba did the same for the tethers man now as you know between the years 1806 and 1820 haiti was divided between two governments the kingdom of haiti in the north and the republic of haiti in the south as you know the north dominated heavily by the blacks and the former slaves down south heavily dominated by the afonchi the mulattoes the sons of the frenchmen etc etc in the first half we brought out documents from Dessalines government, Christoph's government. Now we're going to bring out documents from the mulatto governments, the mulatto governments of Pétion, Boyer, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're moving into the 18 teens, into the 1820s. All right, let's jump right into it. Now bear with me, because like I said, I've been up all night, so I'm kind of sleepy, but I don't really know who exactly wrote this letter to the Haitian government, right? But I do know it was received by General Joseph Balthazar Ingeniac. Now, as we know, I believe he was the minister of war under Dessalines back way back in the day but i think around this time he was either under general pechon or general boyer right so just follow me in this letter you'll see someone writing to general isignac and then he's gonna reply to them right so i'm just gonna read the whole thing for y'all let's jump right into it having lately visited the island of haiti to satisfy myself and some particular friends respecting the present situation of those once oppressed sons of daughters in africa it was a matter of great consolation to me not only to find them freed from cruel bondage which they once labored under but by strict inquiry to find them fast improving in their morals while i was in port au prince i had frequent interviews with the secretary general of government mr Batazar ingenyak from whom i received the following documents which i take the liberty to present to the public for the encouragement of those who are zealous for the prosperity of africans to you dear friends who 
labor for the abolition of slavery that cursed traffic is not the day fast approaching when you will see your labor's recompense when the monsters of human shape shall no more haunt the coast of africa to deprive the wife of her husband and the husband of the wife the parent of the children and the children of the parent when they shall enjoy the blessings of peace and the love of god shall fill their hearts in ethiopia stretch out her hands to heaven with the rest of the christian world but to you proud monsters who deal in human flesh and blood as though they were beasts, have you not reason to fear, lest the wrath of God should burst upon your heads, while your slaves are supplicating the throne of grace in behalf of your souls? Yes, poor wretches, your cases are more pitiable than that of your slaves, but I leave you to the mercy of God. The following letter was given to me in Port-au-Prince by Mr. Injun Yak as an invitation to the colored people in America to immigrate to that country. Now listen, the ancestors told me not to be childish, but listen, in the early 1800s, y'all were not only fleeing, but y'all were skating, y'all were skedaddling, y'all were getting up out of there, and I don't blame you, bro, I don't blame you listen we were willing to put up money for it we don't blame you we didn't insult you we didn't make fun of you we didn't denigrate you for that bro we didn't denigrate you for the fact that you couldn't overthrow your own colonial government and you had to wait for us to overthrow ours so you could have a safe space to sit in the western hemisphere listen we didn't make fun of you for that we didn't insult you for that we didn't denigrate you for that and i know the ancestors are looking down on me shaking their head like bro you have to do them like that bro come on you childish come on man you being petty you being petty but i gotta be petty i gotta be petty listen listen i gotta do it you know why i'm allowed to be petty because i'm actually telling the truth you're lying you're being petty and on top of that you're lying you're just telling lies you're telling fabrications of history and you're counting on the fact that people are not well read people are not knowledgeable of the historical record to debunk you and correct you when you put out false statements but i'm bro i'm well read yes i'm in my late 20s but i am well read i am 10 times more intelligent than you who is a fossil a senior citizen yes Tariq, we know you are an elder but please sit down move out the way the young boys is coming through smashing the game and we know 10 times more than you do and listen stop talking about pan-africanism listen stop talking about black immigrants stay in your place stay in your lane and we won't have no problems okay let's jump back into it the secretary general near his excellency the president of haiti to mr james treadwell i guess that was a i don't know uh abolitionist i'm assuming sir i have communicated to the president of haiti the verbal message which you brought me from your fellow countrymen the black and colored men of the city of New York who groan under the dominion of a barbarous prejudice and desire to become partakers of those blessings which the constitution we have given ourselves afford. This message, sir, cannot but be received with the greatest satisfaction by those who have sacrificed eight and 20 years of their life in order to efface the traces of a yoke to which other men who pretend to virtue and justice had too long enchained them, the patriots who have fought to erect the Republic of Haiti and render it independent of a despotic monarchy have never forgotten during the period of their painful labors that far from them there existed brethren of the same complexion with themselves who sooner or later would need a helping hand to draw them from the infamy prepared for them by certain men priding themselves on account of a white skin who would have thought sir that in the legislature of the united states of america a resolution should have gone forth tending to expatriate a portion of men whom its fundamental law the constitution of the country has recognized as members of the union in common with others as citizens equals free and independent a portion of men who have helped to acquire and defend this very independence which the members of the national legislature boast that they will maintain and violate Oh shame, if from the bosom of eternity, the spirit of Washington could bear such a proposition by which some of the United States of America would brand the foreheads of the men of color with the seal of reprobation and send them to vegetate among the wilds of Africa, how would that noble soul revolt at the idea? Did then the hero of Columbia lead forth men to combat for the deliverance of the country that one day the same men would be ignominiously driven from that land which they had sprinkled with their blood and saved by their courage? A just indignation, sir, ought to inspire your oppressed fellow countrymen. Well, let them know how to oppose the person execution to the firmness of men made to be respected let them abandon in a grateful country which repulses them and seek elsewhere a more hospital land before violence drags them into regions uninhabitable by civilized men open their eyes to the constitution of our republic and let them see in its fourth article a fraternal hand open to their distresses since they are at this day refuse the title of members of the american union let them come among us in a country firmly organized and enjoy the rights of citizens of haiti of happiness and of peace lastly let them come and show the white men that there yet exists covered in black men who can raise a fearless front secured from insult and from injury man listen you talking about pan-africanism Tariq bro Tariq please please leave pan-africanism alone man don't ever talk about pan-africanism again don't talk about black immigrants again bro listen you know what I'm just gonna stamp it bro the Haitian man is the most pan-african man in the western hemisphere the Haitian man is the spearhead, the vanguard, the representative, and the global ambassador for Pan-Africanism, and he has been for the past 218 years, and that's a fact. Look up at the scoreboard, tell you that's a fact. Read the books of history, and tell you that's a fact. Let's get back into it. We are well aware, sir, 
that the enemies of our independence, by rest and shallow policy, please themselves in spreading reports respecting the stability of our republic, which are capable of intimidating none but those pusillanimous souls who are weak enough to prefer degradation to the enjoyment of the sacred rights of men. You who have leisure and opportunity to see our means of defense against all those who dare to attack us, you, sir, can make known to our compatriots that the Republic of Haiti has no more to fear from invasion than that of the United States. The men of color who desire to become Haitians will find out but little difference in our manner of living from that of the places they shall leave. They who possess some capital will use it either in commerce or in cultivation, which produces ordinarily more than 50% per annum beyond the original disbursement. Men of all arts, of all trades, smiths, braziers, tin men, ship and house carpenters, millwrights, caulkers, coopers, cabinet makers, boot and shoemakers can earn in this place from 6 to $12 per week and even more according to their talents and activity. The cultivators of the soil can get from 2 to $4 per week. Besides the board and lodging, those amongst the last class who have numerous families can find portions of land already planted, either in coffee, sugarcane, or cotton to work on shares with the proprietors. The result of these associations are very advantageous to those who undertake them. Others who can raise stock, particularly horned cattle, laborers are in great demand and will easily gain a dollar per day. If industrious, besides board and lodging, sailors will find employment either in the coasting trade or long voyages. In a word, all such as will come with the resolution to establish themselves in this country will be protected by the government, which on its part will grant bounties of land to those who wish it. Men, women, and children of color, let them come. We will receive them with pleasure and we wait for them with open arms. Now, time out, time out. Let me have a real talk. Let me have a real talk with Tariq Nasheed. One of my biggest problems with Tariq Nasheed is he always says that black immigrants should come to America and should help out and should build and should, you know, provide jobs for FBA. Listen, I'm of the opinion that if we're coming to America, FBA should already have infrastructure popping, jobs popping, ready to plug us in, got their corporations popping, got their cities popping, got their enclaves popping, got their shops and convenience stores and grocery stores popping, got their banks popping. You should have everything already on deck to plug us in because we are coming to your territory. When you came to Haiti, we did not say you had to come and build this and do that and do that. We said, bro, we already got it made. We got the plantations already ready. We got the cultivation already ready. We got the money already ready. We got the land already ready. We got the citizenship already already ready we got everything already ready just come through we'll pay the cost come through bro we didn't say you had to come build the country for us and come do this and help us we said bro we got everything already on deck we already living in peace bro come through you don't got to worry about nothing bro come through we know how they doing you over there just come through bro you're supposed to have everything already on deck for us you say black immigrants are not on code well guess what black immigrants when they come to america they can't come to fba for a job bro they got to go to the white man, bro. They got to go to Goldman Sachs. They got to go to Dwayne Reed. They got to go to Walgreens. They got to go to, you know what I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase. They got to go to random white companies, bro. They got to go work for, you know, Pfizer. They got to work for the big major white companies. There's no FBA companies. There's no FBA infrastructure to plug us in, bro. You should be able to plug us in. Don't you see the documents? We said, come through. We'll plug you in. We already have the infrastructure already set up. We already been free for many years already. Just come through. We'll plug you right in. We have everything ready. We got the coffee. We got the sugar cane. We got everything you need if you're an artist and if you're a shoemaker you got you can have a job you can get money yo bro everything is already on deck we got money waiting for you and you got a job waiting for you and we'll give you citizenship and we'll give you land and we'll give you advance money once you get here and we'll pay the cost for the ship bro come on bro give me the equivalent give me the equivalent give me the equivalent you want black immigrants to worship you and get on code but you don't even got a damn grocery store for us to even sweep the floor in bro come on man come on come on you talking about you the vanguard you the spearhead bro stop it don't ever talk about pan-africanism ever again bro it's clear as day the haitian man is like the mvp for pan-africanism he's like the michael jordan of pan-africanism all right the best you could be is like nate robinson of pan-africanism or something like that bro the haitian man is the michael jordan of pan-africanism the ronaldinho of pan-africanism okay you know what i'm saying he's literally the king of pan-africanism he's literally the greatest pan-africanist to ever live bro like bro pan-africanism is synonymous with haitian culture to be a haitian a real haitian is to be a pan-africanist period point blank so when i see you attack pan-africanism i feel like you attack my identity bro straight up let's get back into it I shall be flattered, sir, if this statement of facts, this genuine picture, which you can present to our unhappy fellow countrymen, shall determine a great number of them to come and console themselves beneath the protection of our laws from the cruel idea of being transported to the deserts of Africa, the land is true, whence we all derive our origin, but which our civilization has not rendered altogether a foreign country. Now listen, I don't agree with that. You gotta understand, Ingenyak, you know, he was the he was the secretary general under the mulatto regime. So keep in mind, you know what I mean? He was under the mulatto regime. Listen, 
Listen, listen, we, we, we do not feel like, I do not feel like that. You know, Christoph did not feel like that. We did not feel like the, we did not feel like Africa was a faraway desert. That's a foreign country. All right. Listen, 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 you got to understand these was the mulatto boys. You know what I'm saying? These were the light skinned boys that, you know, the daddies from France. You, you dig what I'm saying? So, you, you know, listen, listen, just forgive him, forgive him, forgive him, forgive him. He was the, you know, he was the secretary general of the, you know, the half breed. So listen. Listen, that does not take away from the Pan-Africanism, you know, because he, you know, threw some shade at Africa. Listen, you got to understand he never been to Africa back in the year 1820, 1820, whatever this was. You know what I mean? Ingenyak never been to Africa and there was no social media. There was no, you know, magazines. There was nothing back then of Africa, bro. So listen, you have to forgive him. You have to forgive him. He was a he was a colony boy. He was born in the colony and he was running with the mulattoes. So just forgive him. You know, we, we forgive him. Yo, Ingenyak, you know, listen, you listen, we got to We got to We got to spank you a little bit. We got to spank you. You know, I, I ain't like that sentence. Talking about Africa is a faraway foreign desert country. We're not, you know, listen, listen, we're not going to be ignorant like the FBAs, all right? Listen, we're not, we're not going to be ignorant like that. And when I say FBA, I do not mean the entire black American collective. We're talking about Tariq Nasheed supporters, Tariq Nasheed's fan base, right? Those are the FBAs, not the entire black American community. Because to be honest, most black Americans think Tariq Nasheed is an idiot and his ideology is one that's doomed to fail. So I'm not talking about all black Americans. I'm talking about the FBA. Ingenyak was sounding like an FBA, you know, talking about, oh, Yes, you know, the deserts of Africa, our civilization is a foreign. No, 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 no. I don't agree. I don't agree. And in fact, I condemn that statement by Bantazar Ingenia. I condemn it. Anyways, let's get back into it. The character of the president, which you have been able to appreciate, guarantees to you, sir, as well as to your fellow citizens, the good reception of those who desire to become our brethren and friends. The government will pay the passages of those who have no means at the rate of $40 per head like i said bro that's damn near a thousand a, st a stack per head bro forty dollars per head for men and women and half that sum for children from three to twelve years of age i have the honor to salute you signed Badaza Ingenyak. Woo! listen listen you talking about pan-africanism let's talk about pan-africanism bro don't ever talk about pan-africanism ever again in your damn life you a liar a propagandist and a fraud and we're gonna make sure that we expose you for what you are now let's get back into it man joseph Bataza Ingenyak was born in Leogan. He was a Haitian diplomat and member of the presidential inner circle. He served as the secretary general for two of the longest serving presidents, Alexander Pétion and Jean-Pierre Boyer. This was a position similar to the present day chief of staff. Yes, you know, black men, you know, doing our doing our thing, you know. Even I got to salute the Mulatto brothers too. Them, th those are the brothers too, man. Listen, those are the, those are the brothers too, man. You know, they said a lot of nonsense. They did a lot of nonsense, but there was the family too. You know, they might have sold the country out when they agreed to pay their reparations that in 1825. But listen, they were the family, too. You know, those are our, those are our half brothers. You know, those are our half breed brothers. You know, they sold the country out. But those are our brothers. And they were there at the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1803. They were there on the battlefield in 1803 and 1804. They were there. They were there. They were there. They were, there. They were part of our family. They were part of our brotherhood going back since the 1500s. They were there once the first white man, you know, had sex with the first black woman on the island. And ever since then thousands of our mulatto brothers came through so they are part of the family whether we like it or not so let's get back into it let's read this quote by frederick douglas and i believe frederick douglas served as the consul or the ambassador to haiti from the united states in the 1890s if i believe look that up if i'm mistaken but let's talk about what frederick douglas said we should not forget that the freedom that you and i enjoy today is largely due to the brave stand taken by the black sons of Haiti 90 years ago. Striking for their freedom, they struck for the freedom of every black man in the world. Of course, and a black woman too. The black woman was on the field of battle too. The black woman had her machete in her hand too. The black woman had the shotgun in her hand too. The black woman was shooting the Frenchman in the head too. The black woman was poisoning the Frenchman in his food too. The black woman was sleeping with the Frenchman and poisoning him too. The black woman was setting up the Frenchman for assassination too. The black woman was ready to die ready to sacrifice a life too so listen yes the black man and woman yes yes we was chopping off heads too yeah 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 frederick Douglass, fba actually he's not fba because he don't know Tariq. he would not subscribe to the nonsense that Tariq said he would come back from the grave and shake his head and be like this guy is an agent this guy is a fraud this guy is a xenophobe this guy is a charlatan this guy is a imposter that's what frederick Douglass would say yes frederick Douglass. he would say that about Tariq and she guaranteed now let's get back into it and yes today we even breaking out the black american history bro i'm telling you i was up all night i do this bro i know this listen i breathe this i live this bro you cannot touch me bro let's go ebenezer bassett was born 1833 
was the United States ambassador to Haiti from 1869 to 1877. He was the first African-American diplomat. Bro, the first African-American diplomat. Where did he go? He went to Haiti. Bro, I don't ever want to hear Pan-Africanism out your mouth ever again. Let's jump back into it. He was the principal of the Institute for Colored Youth in Philadelphia. Ebenezer Bassett was appointed as new leaders emerged among free African Americans after the American Civil War. An educator, abolitionist, and civil rights activist, Bassett was the U.S. diplomatic envoy in 1869 to Haiti, the Black Republic of the Western Hemisphere. Through eight years of bloody civil war and coup d'etat there, Bassett served in one of the most crucial but difficult postings of his time. Haiti was of strategic importance in the Caribbean Basin for its shipping lanes and as a naval coaling station. Now remember, we gotta take Wikipedia with a grain of salt, but listen, I was just so in a rush. I was up all night, bro. I was just compiling information. I'm not a fan of Wikipedia, but today it'll do. Today it'll do. I got enough government documents to offset the Wikipedia documents anyway. So I only got a few Wikipedia documents. The most I'm coming with is government, official documents, newspapers, everything from the time period. Straight up. Come with the same, Tariq. Reply. When you reply, come with the same historical facts of you giving me the response, giving me the equivalent of everything that I'm throwing at you right now, bro. Give me the equivalent to everything. Now, we're going to stop the regular schedule programming for a commercial break. Get in the description box. Get into the cash app. While you hit your cash app, I'm going to read this quote from the legendary, legendary Haitian author, Haitian scholar, Haitian politician, Haitian diplomat, Demis Vardelom. While you getting that cash app, donate to your boy for this elite debunking session that we throwing at that boy Tariq Nasheed. After this, he has no credibility. His credibility is destroyed. Now get in that cash app, donate to your boy. Support the channel, bro. Support the channel. I've been up all night. Yes, I'm going to tell y'all to donate on this one. Listen, this is elite information that I'm bringing directly to the streets for free. No paywall. Show your boy that love and I'm going to read this quote. This country, the more unhappy it is, the more I love and cherish it. The worse she is judged abroad, the more affection and devotion I feel for her. It is with respect, with pride, that I call myself the son of those generous men who, at the voice of the humanitarian revolution of 1789, conquered on this land of Saint-Omingue the rights of man and the citizen, and founded there an asylum to their oppressed race in the Americas. Whatever admiration I profess for the nations where civilization has developed, whatever sympathy and esteem I meet in those countries where I find all the satisfaction of intelligence and where I pursue and use my persevering studies, however lively and deep the feelings of gratitude inspired in me by the benevolent hospitality given to me in my misfortunes, I would never consent for any advantage whatsoever to alienate my quality of Haitian citizen. This land of Haiti, which I love so intimately, this land where I was born, where my father and my mother, my grandfathers and my grandmothers were born, when people ask me abroad what country I am from, and when confusing places and names, people talk to me about Tahiti, I answer, you are wrong. I am from the country where the drama of this and OJ took place, and that of Toussaint Louverture. Demis Vardelon from the year 1873. Now, back from the commercial break, get in that cash app, donate to your boy. Let's jump back into it. Now, y'all remember that black American scholar that I introduced at the beginning of the video, Prince Saunders? Let's break out the government documents once again. This one is from the King of Haiti to Mr. James Moore, director of the British National Vaccine Establishment. Let's go. Sir, Mr. Prince Saunders has presented me with the work which you sent me on the smallpox. I have accepted his work with pleasure and thank you infinitely for your honorable and obliging attention and the interest which you evince for the Haitians. The precious discovery of vaccination is too important to human life and does too much to honor humanity not to induce me to adopt it in my kingdom. On the arrival of Mr. Prince Saunders, I put vaccination in use with the view to make it generally followed by the Haitian practitioners. We have an innumerable amount of children to vaccinate. It is my intention to give every possible latitude to the happy results of this immortal discovery, which I had not hitherto had been able to put in practice in consequence of the disappointment which I was met in Jamaica, St. Thomas, and the U.S. Relative to this object, the salutary effects of which I am well acquainted with, this benefit will still add to the gratitude of the Haitians for the great and magnanimous British nation. I have charged Mr. Prince Saunders to testify to you personally my sincere thanks. Signed, Henry. Listen, man, back in them days, man, black American, man, Haitian, man, we over here, you know, stockpiling modern medicine. You know, we vaccinating our children, our women and our children. Bro, I'm telling you, you talking about Pan-Africanism, bro. Listen, I'm talking, bro, give me the modern equivalent, bro. Give me the modern equivalent where the FBA man came through, set up a government and was integrating the tethers and the African booty scratchers into the ruling class political elite sector of that society. Tell me when the FBA man returned the favor to the black Haitian man, to the black Haitian dirty foot sandal wearing tether. Tell me when you returned the favor, my brother. Now, listen, we weren't asking for you to return the favor, but because you are so petty and immature and you are a propagandist and you are a charlatan and you are a fraud. Now I have to come for your head top, bro. It is what it is, man. It is what it is, bro. I, I got to debunk your theories, bro. I got to debunk your falsehoods, man. Let's jump back into it. 
in this next section, we are going to get into the letters written to and from President Jean-Pierre Boyer during his time in power when he was orchestrating the immigrants from the United States to come to the Republic of Haiti. Yes, yes, yes. The FBA, the black Americans, they were fleeing from their homeland, you know, to come be with the with the tethers up in Haiti. You know, we had established a government that was free and that was doing international commerce and business. And we had everything set up. All they had to do was plug themselves in. Unlike today where Tariq wants us to come and quote unquote be on code and be down with the squad, but he has no infrastructure to plug in one single black immigrant. Can Tariq Nasheed even employ five black immigrants? Like, do, does he have the power to employ five now think about it bro the white man got the power to employ like five million black immigrants so we can achieve by himself he don't got the power to employ five black immigrants but he wants the whole legion of black immigrants all the what five million black immigrants to bow down and pay homage bro get out of here man you don't even got the economic power to employ five people bro my family can employ five people bro <laughs> oh my god let's jump back into it oh god in prosecuting an agency on behalf of the noble objects of the American Colonization Society, I found the public feeling generally was very favorable to the emigration of the colored people to Haiti. Among the colored people themselves, a preference of Haiti over Africa was frequently expressed, and among the whites, there was not only an opposition to colonization in Africa, manifested by many, but an assurance given of their ready aid to promote emigration to Haiti. The present peaceful state of the island and their fair prospects before the Haitians of having their independence acknowledged by other nations indicated that the great obstacles in the way of emigration there, which had existed, were removed, and at the time had now come to aid our colored population to plant themselves under the mild climate of that island, were it encouraged by the Haitian government. On inquiry, I found very little was known definitely in this country what the views of the government were on this subject, there were some favorable reports brought by persons of color who had been to Haiti. Others gave discouraging accounts, except some liberal offers by the Secretary Ingenieur, which I had seen. The information obtained was limited and uncertain. Under these circumstances, the letter with which correspondence commences was addressed through the Secretary General, Batazar Ingenieur, to the President of Haiti. The generous reply of the President, together with the arrival in this country of his agent, Jonathan Granville, with ample means to carry into effect the philanthropic overtures of President Waye, shows what great good may now be hoped for our unhappy countrymen who are the objects of his generosity. I will add that perhaps I did not write so explicitly as to leave no room for doubt whether I wrote as the agent and at the direction of the American Colonization Society or not. Yet, if more explicitness had prevented the reply of the president, few probably will regret that delinquency occurred even though they may not excuse the delinquent. L.D. Dewey. As we know, L.D. Dewey was part of the ACS New York, June 15th, 1824. As you know, President Jean-Pierre Boyer was in control of the entire island during that time, I believe. As we know, the son of a white man and a black woman. So just keep that in mind. But listen, at the end of the day, he did still accept the immigrants that were fleeing from their country in America. Now, let's jump back into it. To His Excellency, the President of Haiti, President Boyer. The important and interesting subject on which I write is my reason for addressing myself directly to the Chief Magistrate of Haiti. My duty as agent of the ACS, as well as my own feelings, leads me to desire information on every point that looks like affording benefit to my unhappy colored countrymen. The first view would suggest that mutual benefit might result to them and your nation by their settlement in your island. But a moment's reflection shows that this must depend on the circumstances under which they shall find themselves placed when removed to Haiti. I am not ignorant that you may have made offers of a favorable kind and that even late information from an immigrant with you shows that you afford them some strong motives to migrate to your island. Yet I am ignorant of many things which would be necessary to be known before the immigration could be aided by the ACS. Will you then, Mr. President, furnish me information on the following points for which I shall be truly grateful and which may be very useful to the colored people of this country? Let's get into the reply. The president of Haiti, Jean-Pierre Boyer, what did he reply? Let's start at the bottom of this page, right? Port-au-Prince, the 30th of April, 1824, year of our independence, the 21st year. Jean-Pierre Boyer, President of Haiti, to Mr. Loring Dewey, agent of the ACS at New York. Sir, I had the satisfaction to receive the letter of the 4th of March last, which you addressed to me, the contents of which breathed the most perfect philanthropy, to consecrate our cares, to ameliorate the lot of a portion of the human race, sadly borne down by the weight of misfortune, is to prove the excellence of one's heart, and to acquire an eternal right to the gratitude of every living creature that can feel, and the step which you have taken in reference to me, in favor of the descendants of the Africans who are in the United States and who are compelled to leave the country because that, far from enjoying the rights of free men, they only have an existence precarious and full of humiliation entitles you to the gratitude of the Haitians who cannot see with indifference the calamities which afflict our brethren. As soon as I was informed of the resolution taken in the United States to transport into Africa our unhappy brethren 
and thus to restore them to their native sky. I comprehend the policy which had suggested this measure and at the same time conceived a high opinion of those generous men who are disposed to make sacrifices in the hope of preparing for the unfortunate persons who are its objects in asylum with their existence would be supportable. Thenceforth, by a sympathy very natural, my heart and my arms have been open to greet in this land of true liberty those men upon whom a fatal destiny rests in a manner so cruel. I considered the colonization of barbarous regions with men accustomed to live in the midst of civilized people as a thing impractical to say nothing more. Now time out, hold up, hold up. I gotta say, keep in mind, listen, Jean-Pierre Baye, he is the son of a white man. He is a mulatto, all right? So when you see, you know, when you see these boys throwing shade at Africa, you gotta understand, you know, they 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 mama, you know, they mama and they, and they daddy, you know, it's uh, you know, they daddy is not a black man, you know what I mean? So his his image of a patriarch, his image of a leader, his image of a father, his image of a of someone who that he wants to be like is a white man. So just keep in mind, yes, he's still a black man. He still love his brothers in the United States, but this is a mulatto man born in the 1800s, born in the 1700s. So you got to understand he's a product of his time. You got to understand this the same man that agreed to pay the debt to France, Jean-Pierre Boyer. You got to understand, you know, he wasn't a full black man. You know, <laughs> let's get back into it. The experiment made at Sherbro and at Mersarado proved that I was not far from the truth. In fine, sir, although Africa be the cradle of our fathers, what a frightful prospect it is to see themselves exiled to insalubrious crimes. After having inhaled the healthful breezes of the land of their birth, I have often asked myself why Haiti, whose climate is so mild and whose government is analogous to that of the United States, was not preferred as their place of refuge, fearing that my sentiments would be misinterpreted. If I made the first overture, I contended myself with having explained to those of them who came to Haiti all the guarantees and rights that the Constitution of the Republic had established in their favor. I have aided in freeing those from debt who cannot quite pay for their passage. I have given land to those who wish to cultivate it, and by my circular of the date of the 24th of December, 1823, to the officers of districts, of which I send you a copy, you will convince yourself that I have prepared for the children of Africa coming out of the United States all that can assure them of an honorable existence in becoming citizens of the Haitian Republic. But now that you make overtures, which seem to be authorized by the respectable society of which you are the general agent, I am about to answer frankly to the eight questions which you have addressed to me. One, if a number of families, the government of the Republic will aid in paying part of the expenses of the voyage of those who cannot bear them. You see that, bro? The black man was like, bro, I'll pay for anybody who don't even got bread. Let's get back into it. Provided the ACS will do the rest. The government will give fertile lands to those who wish to cultivate them, will advance to them nourishment, tools, and other things of indispensable necessity until they shall be sufficiently established to do without this assistance. To what extent in number? No matter what number of immigrants, all those who will come with the intention to submit themselves to the laws of the country shall be well received. The price of passage and other expenses shall be discussed by agents to obtain the most advantageous conditions. The quantity of ground shall be as much of each family can cultivate. For the rest, the utmost goodwill to the newcomers shall be the basis of the arrangement. What encouragement will be given to the mechanics and merchants? They shall have perfect liberty to labor in their respective professions. The only privilege will be an exemption from the law of patent for the first year. Will opportunity be given? All those, I repeat it, who will come shall be well received, no matter what may be their number, provided they submit themselves to the laws of the state, which are essentially liberal and protecting, and to the rules of the police, which tends to repress vagrancy, to maintain good order, and to confirm the tranquility of all. There is no price to stipulate for as respects the land, since the government will give it gratis, meaning for free, in fee simple, to those who will cultivate it. As long as you want to work the land, meaning, yo, if you want to work the land, you can have the land for free. Listen, we'll pay the voyage, come through, it don't matter, no limit. You could bring every black man over here, we'll pay for everybody, and we'll get them land and citizenship. Isn't Tariq always talking about, where's the land, where's my citizenship, where's my land? Well, we gave it to you back in the year 1825, goofball. Where's our land, where's our citizenship? We had to freaking pay for our citizenship. We had to freaking pay and pay out of pocket for everything that we, we got over here. We didn't get no free land and no $25,000 from FBA. Oh my God, bro. Where is the reciprocation? Where is the reciprocity? You know, where is the returning of the favors? Let's get back into it. The immigrants will be distributed in the most advantageous manner possible, and those who may desire it shall be placed in the neighborhood of each other. Now, let's get to another key figure of the 1800s that is not really talked about. Pierre Joseph Marie Gonville, let's talk about it, also known as Jonathan Gonville, let's go, was a Haitian educator, legal expert, soldier, and a diplomat. He was born a free mulatto in saint Omang. He was a musician and a poet, a skilled swordsman, a diplomat, a civil servant. From about 1806 to 1815, Gonville served under Napoleon as a junior officer during the Emperor's campaign in Germany, France, and Austria. After the Bourbon Restoration, he returned to Haiti with his mother and his sisters, where he quickly entered into the service of General Alexander Pichon's government. In 1824, he visited 
visited the United States to promote the immigration of free blacks to Haiti. At his return in 1825, he established a private school, which will be camp, which became known as the Glenville Institute before being asked to lead the National Lycée in Port-au-Prince. He is considered to be the intellectual father of the 1843 revolution that finally dislodged Jean-Pierre Boyer's authoritarian regime. Glenville was regarded as well-educated and refined, a man of knowledge and virtue. He made popular in the U.S. the Persian saying, I write insults on sand and favors on marble. Now listen, man, listen, listen. Back in the early 1800s, man, the black man was moving through the Western Hemisphere like a dawn, man. The black man was moving through the Western Hemisphere like a boss, man. The black Haitian man especially. But, bro, we was doing the damn thing, man. We was doing the damn thing for real, for real, for real. Now, let's jump back into it, man. Returning to Haiti, Jonathan Gunville married Louise Saracen, a cousin of President Boyer, on November 24th, 1817 in Port-au-Prince. He had two children. His son, Henry, would later publish books about his father and his work in Haiti. Henry included in the volume letters written between Boyer and his father, as well as personal notes of Gunville. Immigration plans. When Haitian President Jean-Pierre Boyer, in collaboration with Joseph Batazar Ingeniac, extended an invitation for U.S. blacks to settle on Hispaniola. Glenville served as emissary, playing a major role in Boyer's plans. Haitian leaders believed free blacks should migrate to Haiti instead of Liberia, where the ACS promoted as the preeminent location for immigrants. With tension growing between the ACS and Boyer, Boyer used Glenville to seal his plans for the free blacks of the U.S. In May 1824, Glenville was sent to Philly in an attempt to encourage free blacks to migrate to Haiti. Along with 50,000 pounds of coffee, Boyer provided Glenville with a fund to pay in full the migrant passage to Haiti. Listen, bro, the black man was like, bro, 50,000 pounds of coffee, bro. I'm telling you, bro. Man, listen, ain't nobody did it big as the Haitian man back in the early 1800s, bro. Ain't nobody did it as big. Ain't no black man did it big ever since. We was the last black man to ever really do it on a grand major scale that ain't nobody ever seen since then. And the black race has never gone back to that level of power and prosperity ever since. Now, let's get back into it. Gunville's appeals to blacks in Philly began and soon spread to New York and Boston. His message highlighted the benefit that Haiti provided and eventually spread to Baltimore and Indiana. With the backing of the Haitian government, Gunville and his companions, Prince Saunders and Loring Dewey, guaranteed the migrants economic prosperity in Haiti. They were also promised free passage, provision for several months, and three acres of land apiece. Other incentives included higher wages for artisans, a guaranteed six to twelve Haitian dollars per week, and forty dollars per family for simply taking the voyage. Gunville, along with his colleagues, preached in churches, fraternal halls, and amongst mutual aid societies. This created excitement for many black Americans and soon spread to many important figures and leaders in the black community. Gunville won over many influential people, such as Nicholas Biddle, president of the Second Bank of the United States, Merchant Prince Stephen Gerard, who's a thief. I believe years back, Toussaint Louverture actually deposited money, I believe, in a bank or something with Steven Gerrard. And after Toussaint was captured and died, Steven Gerrard pretty much kept the money and pretty much built infrastructure in the United States with the money that Toussaint Louverture deposited in an American bank. So that's why I call him a thief. But, you know, since he was, you know, still working with the Haitian government years later, I guess, you know, I guess he wasn't a total demon. But yes, he was still a thief. Anyways, let's get back into it. Merchant David Corey. Also, lending their support to Glenville were the Marquis de Lafayette and Scottish reformer Francis Wright. With impeccable manners and an ability to keep his feelings to himself, unlike, you know, the Tariq Nasheed supporters who are very emotional and irrational, you know, Glenville was able to work with and convince others. Glenville was often confused about the way black Americans lived and the things that concerned them, especially their constant disagreements about religion. Feeling uncomfortable surrounded by whites who frequently mistreated him, Cause you know the black man in Haiti, you know he's used to you know being a a you know being respected on his territory. He's he's used to feeling like a man when he walks outside. He's used to being a a man in power, a man in dominion. So when he goes to the United States and these white boys is looking at you funny and bumping you on the shoulder and talking about you can't eat at the freaking restaurant, you can't eat at the burger spot because you a black man, even though you a light skinned man. But even then, you still get disrespected. So yeah, you know Gunville was not used to you know being disrespected and the racism, you know, because the black man ruled in Haiti. So we don't got no white man, you know, punking us around back in Haiti. So Gunville was like i don't i don't understand this you know what i'm saying but anyways let's get back into it man feeling uncomfortable surrounded by whites who frequently mistreated him gunville often requested Boye to relieve him of his duties in america and allow him to go home to haiti Boye repeatedly denied his request instructing him to finish the work that he began listen bro listen Boye was like listen we got to get our brothers up out of there listen stop being a punk 
I know them white boys, you know, they talking about you can't go shop at the mall because you a black man. You got to go shop at the blacks only mall. You can't go to the white coffee shop. No, you got to go to the black coffee shop. You know, you got to get the green book. You know, you got to make sure you don't go to the sundown towns. You know, the black man, the, the black Haitian man, he's like, yo, I don't understand this, bro. Like, I'm used to walking around wherever I want. I'm used to having it in my way. I'm used to getting respected everywhere I go. I don't understand this. I want to go home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jonathan Glenville was like, I want to go home, man. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. I'm not feeling this. Let's get back into it. One incident during his mission in the U.S. was Gunville's encounter with a lieutenant from the South. While dining at a restaurant in New Brunswick with his colleagues, Gunville was addressed inappropriately and rudely by the visiting lieutenant. The Boston Commercial Gazette records the incident as such. Observing Mr. Gunville at his elbow, the officer remarked, Sir, are you not aware that it is contrary to custom for white men and colored people to eat at the same table? He continued to insult Gunville by declaring that he would not eat with a Negro. Gunville maintained his composure. Gunville responded, Sir, I am an officer also in my own country, and if I were there, it would be part of my duty, sir, to take into custody those Haitians who insult strangers. The lieutenant later realized his mistake and wrote a letter apologizing for his behavior. Yeah, punk. Gunville responded, Sir, I write insults in the sand and favors on marble. Many came to regard Gunville as a man of honor. This officer has conducted himself with the greatest circumspection and has made every favorable impression on the minds of our citizens with respect to his character and talents. Jonathan Gunville left a lasting impression on many people in the United States, both black and white. Mr. Walsh of the National Gazette said the following about Gunville. We have had the pleasure of conversing with and formed a very favorable opinion of his understanding and feelings. He is himself a man of color, but his information, diction, sentiments, and manners place him upon the level of the good society of any country. According to the Newburyport Herald, many were fond of Mr. Gunville and the work he did. It is due to Mr. Gunville to state that, from the day of his landing to the day of his embarkation, we have not heard a whisper against him, although we have heard much in his favor, not only as to the manner in which he had executed the duties of the delicate and important mission, but as the general deportment. Gunville's work in the United States was instrumental in the success of YA's plans for Haiti. Through his demeanor, he not only left a positive impression as a distinguished gentleman of color, and also left a lasting positive impression upon the united states let's get back into it gunville was directly responsible for the first ships that sailed from the u.s with migrants on august 23rd 1825 the ship charlotte corday left with 30 families on board later gunville along with other immigrants finally left philadelphia for haiti after gunville stayed in the united states approximately 6,000 blacks left for haiti I'm sorry to tell those black Americans that left in 1824 or 1825. Tariq Nasheed would call them a bunch of fleers, tethers, cowards. You ran from the power structure. You didn't want to stay in 1825 and get lynched and get abducted into the woods and your wife get smacked up by the white boys and abducted. And, you know, you don't want to stay and get your house bombed by the damn racists at the church. You don't want to stay and fight, fight, fight. No, 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 bro. They wanted to be amongst black people. They wanted to be amongst their own people. They didn't want to live amongst white men ruling over them and smacking them around and you walking home from church and getting kidnapped and brought into the woods and being hung from trees like they don't want to do that bro they wanted to be among black men and women they wanted to live in peace they wanted to just be on their farm and just you know be among the nature and the trees and the tropical weather you know what i mean but of course Tariq would call them a bunch of fleers and tethers they're trying to tether to the haitian uh, infrastructure you know <laughs> you know the country that we built you know but listen we could say well that was the country during that time that was the country that we built like we we built that though. We, we weren't forced to build it though you know what i mean like we we built it for real like we built it because like we wanted to like have a place for our, our women and our children to, to be you know what i mean like we built it for like us and our brothers and our, our mothers and our sisters and our daughters and you know what i mean like we built it for them we we no one was on no one was whipping us to build it we we built it because we wanted to build it and we built it to such a high level in the early 1800s that literally thousands of black people were clamoring to get over here bro and we built it to such a high point in the early 1800s that we had money overflowing we could just throw like fifty thousand pounds of coffee we could just throw like six hundred thousand dollars we would just had money falling from the sky because during that time yes haiti was extremely prosperous you have to understand this was the richest colony on the planet that black men were inheriting it was like inheriting the united states at the time so yes during that time it was prosperity reigning upon the country now after christoph died i mean that's another story you know what i mean after christoph died that's another scenario but yes during that time the early 1800s there was a reason why the blacks in indiana new york philly boston all over the northeast and the southeast they were like yo we got to get down to haiti bro we got it's not it's not no mistake we got to get down to haiti bro we got to get down to haiti you saw prince saunders called it the paradise of the new world you saw bro you saw it bro we got to get down to haiti man so listen at the end of the day man pan-africanism yes pan-africanism yes yes watch your mouth when you speak on pan-africanism 
you clown. Fast forward to 1859, another little known fact is 350 black Americans from Louisiana came to Haiti in the year 1859 under the regime of Faustin Souluk. Now, unfortunately, Haiti was very unstable during this period because Faustin Souluk was trying to reconquer the Dominican Republic, you know, because as we know, it was a case of national security. Haitians always felt during that time that if the Dominican Republic was not under occupation, the fear of the Haitian government during that time was the Dominicans would go on to create bilateral agreements with European powers and European colonists would be reintroduced into the island, which was a fact because the Dominicans literally told the Spanish to come back. So that is why President Faustin Sulu was trying to reconquer the Dominican Republic. And as we know, he was unsuccessful because the Dominican Republic is now an independent state. And shout out to them. Let's fast forward to the late 1800s, early 1900s. Benito Sylvain, let's talk about it, man, was a Haitian journalist, born in Puerto Rico, a diplomat, a lawyer. He was also one of the organizers of the 1900 Pan-African Conference. Sylvain paved the connection between Afro descendants and Africans and became a representative for these groups that were colonized by France. He is arguably considered to be a pioneer of Pan-Africanism. Benito Sylvain was born in Puerto Rico in 1868. In 1887, Around the age of 19, he finished his studies in Paris at the college Stanislas, then attended law school where he obtained his license and then his doctorate. Supported by his country that appoints the officer of marine as secretary to the embassy in London, Sylvain founded in Paris in 1890 a weekly committed against French colonialism, La Fraternité. In 1897, Sylvain, staying in Ethiopia, became the aide-de-camp to Emperor Menelik, who defeated the Italians at the Battle of Ottawa. Sylvain represented both Ethiopia and Haiti at the 1900 Pan-African Conference held in London and was appointed as the honorary president of the Pan-African Association. In 1906, Sylvain, who attended all lectures against slavery, published in Paris his principal work entitled On the Fate of the Natives in the Colonies of Exploitation and Indictment Against Colonialism. As there were very active Afro-descended students in France, including his compatriot Haitians, Sylvain endeavored to make the connection between Afro-descendants and Africans in the spirit of resistance to European colonialism, which he reasoned was a new form of slavery. Facts. Now, now let's put the picture of the big homie up. Let's put the picture so we see him in his military garb, looking honorable, looking respectable, looking illustrious, looking like a general. Bro, look at the homie, man. The honorable, the legendary general, Benito Silvain. Let's talk about it, bro. You talking about Pan-Africanism. You talking about a Haitian man that went over to Africa and was part of the Ethiopian army under Menelik at the Battle of Ottawa. Bro, we talking about Pan-Africanism. We talking about the Pan-Africanism Conference held in London, organized by Anthony Furman, Benito Sylvain, W.E.B. The Boys. Listen, we bit, bro. You talking about Pan-Africanism. You talking about Pan-Africanism. Bro, yo, yo. Look at the homie, man. Look look at General Benito Sylvain. Look at him, man. Look at him, man. Listen, man. Listen, man. Listen, man. <laughs> Listen, man. Don't you ever talk about Pan Africanism ever again. Don't you ever talk about Pan Africanism ever again. Now, in this section of the debunking, we are going to move into the 1900s, the 20th century, right? We're still going to talk about Pan Africanism. We are still going to bring up moments of Pan Africanism, you know, practiced by the tethers, but we are just going to talk about how the black man, the black tether, you know, how the black tether was just, you know, just moving honorable and powerful and prestigious all through the 1900s man yo listen buckle your seat belts man it's about to be a lot of you know a lot of dripping a lot of you know swagging a lot of you know listen just listen let's get into it man not wasting no time since we're talking about pan-africanism let's take a look on the screen right the presidential bus haitian president paul magloire general Paul Magloire happily kisses the hand of Marian Anderson, as we know, the black American famous singer of the time. You know what I mean? We invited her to our 150th anniversary of our independence in Haiti. And when she came through, you know, General Paul Magloire, President Paul Magloire, Chief Paul Magloire was like, you know, what up, baby? What up, baby? You know, I know you're not used to seeing a black man in power, baby. I know you're not used to seeing a black man doing his thing, baby. I know you're not used to seeing a black man wearing these expensive suits, baby. I know you know, I know you probably thought only white man could wear suits like these but no no you know the black man you know the black haitian man the black tether you know yeah we got nice suit collections over here baby how you doing mary and you, you looking so good you looking so good you know say how was the trip how was the trip the plane was good oh no nah, it was like the 1950s was the planes around i don't know was was, was was the boat good was the boat ride good oh you looking good who where'd you get that dress from huh what what brand is that oh that's an italian dress what's that 
Yeah, you looking good. Wait, the general problem glow have the wave spinning? Oh no, nah, no, nah, he don't got the wave. I'm about to save. My man had waves back in the 1950s. Yo, you look at the look on her face. She's like yo, she like yo. I'm around a black man of power, a black man of influence, the most powerful black man in the Western Hemisphere, the only black head of state in the Western Hemisphere. Oh my God, I'm so honored. I'm so honored. I'm not used to this. Yo, listen, you see, look at the energy, bro. Look at the energy. Listen, you talking about Pan Africanism, man? Ask your woman if the black tether practice Pan African. Africanism. Ask your women if the black man from Haiti and the Caribbean and Africa practice Pan Africanism. Don't ask me. Don't ask the white man. Ask your woman. She'll she'll tell you. She'll tell you. <laughs> she'll tell you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get back into it. As we can see, Marian Anderson was a beautiful black woman. You know, I can see why General Paul McGraw was like, yo, I gotta, I gotta introduce myself formally. You know, you don't gotta call me General Paul McGraw, baby. You could just call me Paul. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You could just call me Paul. You know, you gotta, you, you don't gotta call me General. You don't gotta call me President. Just call me Paul. You know what I'm saying? I left my wife. You know, she over there. She over there talking to the talking to the other dignitaries and the other you know people that came through. You know, let, let, let's talk me and you. You know what I'm saying? I, I left Yolette over there. You know, Yolette, she, she busy right now. Don't worry about Yolette. You know, it's about me and you. How, how, how you been? How you been? Where you where you, where you from, baby? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> listen, Paul McGuire was a G man. I guarantee, man. Listen, my man was a smooth cat. General Paul McGraw was a smooth brother. I mean, you could just see it. You could, yo, man, listen, listen. Let's jump back into it, man. Damn, hold up. We got to take a time machine back to the mid-1800s. I forgot a piece of information. Let's jump back into it. Since you want to talk about Pan-Africanism, let's talk about it. Look on the screen, my friend. James Theodore Augustus Hawley, born October 1829 in Washington, D.C., died in port au prince haiti was the first african-american bishop in the protestant episcopal church and spent most of his episcopal career as missionary bishop of haiti yes he did yeah we opened our doors to bishop holly and he died in haiti his you know his daughter came through she stayed in haiti like you know the holly family probably still in haiti right now you know we honored him and everything like we look at him as a haitian in fact within the first like 10 days of his arrival in haiti president fab jeff gave him haitian citizenship in less than two weeks so yeah man shout out to bishop holly big up bishop holly you know i almost forgot about you bro i cannot forget about bishop holly but anyways let's go back to the 1900s real quick yeah i had to pull up the new york times headline so you know i'm not lying i came with the documents and the facts bro the documentation what are you coming with bro except your falsehoods and lies port au prince haiti december 30th marion anderson singer and dr ralph bunch director of the u.n trusteeship division headed prominent americans arriving today for the 150th anniversary of haiti's independence from france view article in the time machine so listen this was from like the 19 1954 december 40th 1954 as you know or 1953, I should say, because it was the 150th anniversary, so then it would have been January 1st, 1954. So, yeah, man, listen, Marian Anderson, black American singer, very famous, you know what I mean? In fact, let's show how she came through with her husband, you know what I mean? Dripping and dabbing. And no, her husband was not a white man. I know y'all go, oh my God, no, 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 no. Her husband was not a white man. He was a white passing, super, 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 super light skinned man, colored man who could pass for white, right? You know, it was one of those situations. We didn't have a white man at the damn 150th anniversary. No, no, we, we no, no, no. We didn't have no damn white man coming through with his wh black girlfriend. No, that, no, we did not do that. But look at the outfit, though. Forget what I'm talking about. Look at the outfit, though. Look how she came dripping and dabbing to come through to Haiti to come chill with General Paul McGraw. You talking about Pan Africanism, bro? Look at that outfit, though. Yeah, man. Marion Anderson was a good looking woman, man. Listen, I understand why Paul McGraw had to, you know what I mean, kiss her on the hand. I understand. I understand. I understand. He probably wants to do more than that. You know what I'm saying? And she probably wants to do more than that, too. You know what I'm saying? Being around a man of influence and power like that. She definitely not used to seeing a black man in power like that back in 1954. I guarantee you that. Oh, man. I'll be forgetting information. Let's take a time machine back 50 years. Man, I keep forgetting key figures, man. Let's jump right back into it. Joseph August Antonor Furman, better known as Antonor Furman, was a Haitian barrister and philosopher, pioneering anthropologist, journalist, and politician. Furman is best known for his book, The Equality of the Human Races, which was published in 1885 as a rebuttal to the French book, The Essays on the Inequality of the Human Races. The book asserted the superiority of the Aryan race and the inferiority of the blacks and other people of color. Furman's book argued the opposite, that all men are endowed with the same qualities and the same faults, without distinction of color or anatomical form. The races are equal. He was marginalized at the time for his beliefs that all human races were equal. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. Anyways, let's get back into it. 
Furman is one of the three Caribbean men who launched the idea of Pan-Africanism at the end of the 19th century to combat colonialism in Africa. As a candidate in Haiti's 1902 presidential elections, he declared that the Haitian state should serve in the rehabilitation of Africa, along with Trinidadian lawyer Henry Williams and fellow Haitian Benito Sylvain, who we discovered we, we discussed earlier in the, in the video. He was the organizer of the first Pan-Africanist conference, which took place in London in 1900. The conference launched the Pan-Africanism movement. W.E.B. Du Bois attended the conference and was put in charge of drafting the general report. After the conference, five Pan-African con congresses were held in the 20th century, which eventually led to the creation of the African Union. So, yes, man, you got to big up the Haitian, man. Big up the Tether. Big up the Caribbean and the African, man. Big us up, man. Big up. Big up. Furman was invested in the three main elements of Pan-Africanist thought. The rejection of the postulate of race inequality, proof that Africans were capable of civilization, and examples of successful Africans producing knowledge in diverse fields. In looking to move away from biological understanding of race, Furman's scientific approach was informed by the idea of a black Egypt as the source of Greek civilization. Pan-Caribbeanism Antonor Furman devised between 1875 and 1898 a Caribbean Confederation project which envisioned the unification of Cuba, Haiti, DR, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. Furman was interested in creating political and social unity throughout the Caribbean. This can be seen through his relationship with Puerto Rican intellectual and position Ramon Betances. Now, if you look on the screen now, we got Marion Anderson back again. And who is she dancing with? She is dancing with Haitian poet, diplomat, jean Fernand Bouillet. Listen, let's get into it. Yo, she, yo, listen, tell your girl if the tether was Pan-African or not. Tell your women if the, ask your women if the tether was Pan-Africanist. All right, Tariq, ask your women if the tethers practice Pan-Africanism, all right? Because in every picture, Marion Anderson, she with a Haitian man, you know, she got all her teeth out. You know what I'm saying? She's like, oh my God, these men are so powerful. Oh my God, these men really, you know what I'm saying? They really having it their way. Oh my God, look at their suits. Oh my God, look at they, oh my God. Yo, oh my God, black men having their own country. Oh my God, black men having power. Oh my God, a black head of state. Oh my God, a black man with an army. Oh my God, a black man with a military uniform. Oh my God, you know what I'm saying? Yo, you already know. You already know that coochie was wet, man. Yay. Sorry for the husband. Shout out to the what's her husband name? Orpheus Fisher. Hey, shout out to Orpheus. My bad, bro. But you know, but you know she came to Haiti. You know she was wet, bro. You know she was wet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know she was wet. Every picture she smiling ear to ear, bro. You know she was wet. <laughs> Let's jump back into it. Jean Fernand Bouillet was a Haitian poet, dramatist, journalist, and diplomat. He is recognized as one of the most brilliant Haitian writers and has produced a significant body of poetry to his credit. He also served as Haiti's ambassador to Argentina. Bouillet was born in Jérémy, with the son of Fernand Bouillet and Henriette de Houillet. He descended from a French settler, François Bouillet, who had bought at auction in Saint-Omingue a black Dahomean woman named Rosette, sister of my Cassette Dumas, who also gave birth to the general Thomas Alexander Dumas in Jeremy, who later fathered great French novelist Alexander Dumas. Now, I already did an entire series based on the connection between Haiti and the Dahomey Kingdom, right? So this is just another connection between Haiti and the Dahomey Kingdom. I already got videos like this on my channel. You could just search my channel, just type in Dahomey on the channel, and you'll see a bunch of videos I did, right? Yes, Jean Fernand Bouillet was of Dahomey lineage, all right? Let's jump back into it. Here we got Marian Anderson again. This time she's chilling with the, you know, the beautiful women of Haiti. Look at the women of my country. They just so damn beautiful. I love y'all women. I love y'all babies. I love y'all. Mwah. Love all y'all. Love all y'all. Love all y'all. I love my women so much, bro. I love the women of my country so, so much because when I look at them, I see like my female ancestors that was on the battlefield with the machete right next to their man, cutting the throat of the Frenchman, slicing the heart of the Frenchman, shooting the Frenchman in the head. Like I see them. Like I look at them. Like I see them. I see our women from the battlefield. Bro. I love my women so much, bro. Anyways, let's get back into it, man. You see Marion Ma Marion Anderson. I almost said Marion Barry. God forgive me. Marion Anderson. She right there. I believe she's to the right, our, our right, to the lady that's in the white dress, right? To her left, but to our right. You can you can recognize her, right? She's the one kind of dressed a little different from the rest, right? So, yeah. Marion Anderson, she obviously loved being in Haiti, man. She obviously loved being around, the, you know, in the black men's domain, you know, where the white boys don't rule. You know, well, the white boys were still, you know, in, on our dicks back in them days. But at least back then, you know, the black man had a place to be. She could go and see a black man, you know, in the presidential palace, a black man with his black wife. You know what I'm saying? 
a black man with his black generals, his black armed guards. You know, I, yo, I'm telling you, that coochie was wet. That's why she stayed in Haiti. You know what I'm saying? She stayed in Haiti. Yo, every time she came through, you notice she don't even got her man next to her like that. She she moving through Haiti by herself, man. Listen, that coochie was wet. <laughs> That coochie was wet, you know, it's just something about, you know, being around men with power, you know, men with influence, men with autonomy in a world where, you know, there was no autonomy for the black man back in them days in the 19, early 1950s. It's just something that she didn't, she wasn't used to, you know, back home, people getting hung from trees, you know, over here, the black man in the presidential palace, you know, drinking champagne, you know, stay smoking cigars, you dig? <laughs> Listen, that coochie was wet. Man, that coochie was wet. Let's get back into it. Up on the screen, we got a headline from an American newspaper. Haiti president says U.S. bias will be bad dream. Haitian president General Paul Magua, during a two-day visit to Chicago as part of his two-week U.S. tour as a guest of President Eisenhower, predicted that discrimination in the United States soon will be a bad dream. Interviewed at a press conference, the president said the Supreme Court's anti-school segregation decision was a good omen for elimination of discrimination. While in Chicago, President Magua toured the Johnson Publishing Company, a black-owned business, and the Chicago Defender, a black-owned newspaper. At week's end, his party flew to Boston, where he will enter the New England Baptist hospital for a two-day checkup he told reporters he felt well listen man the black man from haiti was like man, i'm gonna come to see what my brothers up in america doing you know what i'm saying i heard my brothers in america they having businesses they having newspapers they having publishing companies let me see what my brothers is doing let me go rock with my brothers up in america up in chicago you dig president paul mcglaw was like listen i know i came to you know see you know president eisenhower yeah that's cool yeah that's whatever but let's see what my brothers in chicago doing you know what I'm saying? let me go see what the with the johnson publishing company and you know the chicago defender you know what i mean the chicago defender listen pun intended yes they did defend us the chicago defender even during the u.s occupation of haiti they were defending us they were like defending the haitians like against the u.s government so one love to the chicago defender the black owned newspaper chicago defender they defended us during the u.s invasion occupation and i'll even show love i'll pay homage to that that was pan-africanism by black americans but even that does not compare to the mountain top of pan-africanism that i've stacked tall in this video over an hour long this might be two hours long bro i'm telling you bro oh my god bro listen pay respect pay respect you dig pay respect pay your goddamn respect and in this picture we actually got pictures when general paul magua came through to chicago to kick it with the homies you dig haitian president paul eugene magua was greeted by chicago society in the sheridan hotel reception sponsored by dr ulysses daly who as we know was one of the first african americans recognized in the field of medicine in the united states so as you know this was high black society kicking it up in chicago you know black doctors black lawyers black presidents black generals black artists black singers you dig what i'm saying bro you dig you dig you talking about pan-africanism bro listen man the black man from haiti listen listen ask your ancestors how the black man from haiti was mobbing back in them days man Ask your ancestors how the black man from Haiti was mobbing back in them days, man. Let's get back into it, man. Listen, sponsored by Dr. Ulysses G. Daly, honorary Haitian consul in Chicago, while champagne bubbled briskly from a fountain and armed guards and tuxedos mingled with the guests, 700 persons gathered to welcome the Magras and wish them a pleasant U.S. tour. Bro, they came through. Look at everybody, bro. Look at every, yo. Listen, listen, listen. Look, look. Look at look at Madame Palm. Look at Madame Magra. Look at your let let court. Yo, listen, Paul Magra's wife. I believe. Let me let, let me confirm it so I don't lie on her, bro. But she comes from she comes from very important black lineage. Okay, she's a very very important person. Yolette let Leconte. She was the niece of President Saint Sanatus Leconte, who was the great grandson of Jean Jacques Dessalines. Yes, yes, Paul Magra's wife is a descendant of General Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and she is the niece of former President saint Sanatis le Comte. Yes, 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 yes. Bro, I'm telling you, bro, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and Paul McGraw is from Northern Haiti. Yes, Northern Haiti, where King Christophe had his kingdom, where General Dessalines had his headquarters, where the revolution popped off at. Yes, he's a, he's a North Side Haiti boy. Yeah, 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 revolution in the soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, it was big business, big paper, armed guards, champagne bubbling in the 1950s. In the sec in the height of segregation, black men was up in Chicago doing our thing, bro. Probably wearing, you know, jewelry all iced out, you know what I'm saying? 10,000 on the wrist, you dig. Now listen, let's get back into it, man. Show respect when you talk about Pan-Africanism. You fraudulent charlatan con artist. Now, if you look up on the screen, you see General Paul McGraw arriving in Havana for a five-day goodwill visit. 
Haitian president and Mrs. Magra are welcomed by Cuban president Fulgencio Batista and a delegation of Cuban officials. Bro, listen, man, listen. Pan Africanism, because the Cubans, they Africans. They said the African descendants. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah, they mix, but they African descendants and they embrace the African heritage to the T, to the bone. You dig what I'm saying? So, yes, this is another, you know, version of Pan Africanism. Listen, I mean, how, listen, bro, I'm giving you damn near two hours of Pan Africanism. Bro, we done took you through the time capsule, bro. Don't you ever open your mouth with disrespect ever again, bro. Oh, oh my God, bro. Oh my God, bro. Oh my God. Oh my God, bro. Now, if you look back up on the screen, Haitian president gets Puerto Rican salute, making a goodwill tour of Caribbean countries. Haiti's president, Paul Magrav, Haiti, is given a 21-gun presidential salute on his arrival in San Juan, Puerto Rico, where he was greeted by the island's governor, Luis Munoz Marin. Listen, listen, man, they gave the boy the 21-gun salute, bro. 21-gun salute up in Puerto Rico, up in Cuba, came through to Chicago. We popping champagne. You know, we up in, you know, the White House with Eisenhower and Nixon. You know, my, my wife looking like a damn model straight out the freaking West African coast. Oh, my God. God, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh my God, the black man in the 1950s was doing his thing. Let's get back into it. You talking about Pan Africanism? Look on the screen to the left, General Pomagra. To the right, President Tubman of Liberia. And as we know, the Liberians are the descendants of Black Americans as well. Listen, Pan Africanism. Look, yo, but look at the, look at, yo, look at the black man, bro. Look at the brothers in their tuxedos and their champagne, yo. Listen, everybody black in the building. Look at the jewelry on our women. Look at, bro. Look at the, we suited and booted. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Pan Africanism. Pan Africanism in the suit. You dig? Pan Africanism in the damn suit. Heads of state. You know what I'm saying? Out of Africa, out the Caribbean. You know what I'm saying? Pass the champagne. Yeah. Look at my picky ring. Yeah. Pass the cigar. Yeah. Look at my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Hold up. Back for another commercial break. Get in the cash app right now. Donate for all this exclusive information. I done stayed up all night to bring all this heat and to debunk Tariq. Now, please get into the cash app right now. Bless your boy, support your boy. Listen, you know I come through every day with the heat, every damn day I don't miss. Let's go, bro. Get in that cash app, support your boy, man. Support your boy, commercial break. And right now, listen, I know this is not Pan-Africanism, but listen, we just gotta show the black man just dripping and swagging and dipping and dabbing. Look at the screen. On the screen, we got General Paul McGraw, and then we got, you know, Richard Nixon. Now, Richard Nixon, I don't give a damn about Richard Nixon, but listen, this is the 1950s, bro. You know, black men still getting hung from trees, bro. And then you got the tethers. The tethers up in the White House, bro. The tethers up in the White House, bro. Yo, yeah, look at look at the white. Yeah, we got yeah we, we up in the White House with our girls, with our with our women. You dig what I'm saying? We up in the White House with our women, dog. Our women having dinner in the White House. The black men having dinner in the White House. You dig what I'm saying? You dig what I'm saying? You talking about you paved the way for the, the, the tethers to come. Man, the tethers was up in the White House when you couldn't even go into the damn Wendy's to buy a burger because the white boys didn't want you eating french fries next to them, bro. The, the tethers was up in the White House. We was up in the White House when you could only go to the colored only section to eat, bro. Don't talk about what you did for the tethers. The tethers was doing it big for 200 years straight. You dig what I'm saying? The tethers was having it our way for a while now. You dig what I'm saying? The tethers was making the black man look good for a while now. So put, watch your mouth when you talk about the tethers. You dig what I'm saying? Because the tethers got a very honorable reputation out here on the world stage. You dig what I'm saying? The tethers really made us look good out here on the world stage. You know what I'm saying? So, Tariq, please don't open your mouth ever, ever, ever again on Pan-Africanism. Ever, ever, ever again on black immigrants. Ever, 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 ever again. You see on the screen, I don't know what Mr. Richard Nixon is showing to General Palmer Gla, but listen, look at my man's suit. General Palmer Gla, listen, Kevin Samuels will be proud, you know what I'm saying? The suit game back in the 1950s. Kevin Samuels will be proud, you know what I'm saying? Suit game, impeccable. Listen, listen the black man got a better suit than the white man, you know what I'm saying? How the black man got a better suit than the white man? Yo, I know, I know Richard Nixon was mad. He's smiling because, you know, he got to be a professional, but he's mad. He's like, damn, bro, his suit more expensive than mine. You know what I'm saying? We supposed to be the United States. How he got the exclusive designer suit? You know what I'm saying? How his wife dressed better than my wife. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know his his wife was dressed mad basic. You know, you know, your let let cunt came through looking extra good, looking extra fine. You know what I'm saying? You know, Paul McGraw, you know, I don't know what they showing, but look at Paul McGraw just driven in dab, got the fresh cut. You know, you had to go to the barber shop this morning before he hopped on a private jet, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Back in the nineteen fifties, man. The black man was up in the damn White House, man. Up in the damn White House. Yeah, the tethers was up in the White House. That should be like the name of an album. The tethers up in the White House. <laughs> 
Y'all know I'll be rapping. Y'all know I'll be rapping. That might be the next mixtape. Yeah, Ted is up in the White House. As we can see, look on the screen once again. Marion Anderson, yes, in Haiti once again. To the right is her husband. No, he's not a white man. He's a white passing, very, 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 very light skinned, multiracial man. But she's smiling. She, listen, Orpheus Fisher, man. Listen, McGraw probably smashed his chick that night, man. McGraw, look, look, look at McGraw smiling. He's like, yo, he don't know I'm about to smash his chick. I'm president of Haiti, man. What you think this is? You, you just over, you just, a, you just a corny looking white boy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, what you think this is, boy? I'm the black man, you know what I'm saying? I'm that untainted, straight from West Africa, you know what I'm saying? Dark skinned black man from Northern Haiti, descendant of George Jacques Dessalie. You dig what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh, it, yo. I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you, man. I hope Orpheus Fisher was holding on to his woman tight. Because I'm telling you, any one of them Haitian men could have ran off with his chick, man. She would have ran off with somebody, a damn lieutenant in the army. Forget cheating on them with the president. She would have cheated on that man with a damn lieutenant in the army, a damn sergeant, a damn police officer. <laughs> Just because he a black man in uniform that she never seen. She not used to it back home. She would have slept with a damn local policeman. You dig what I'm saying? Hey, hey, Marion Anderson. She was a beautiful, beautiful black woman, man. Anyways, let's get back into it. Here we got Pat Nixon, the wife of Richard Nixon, and Yolette Leconte, the wife of General Paul McGraw, and the great-grandniece of General Jean-Jacques Dessalines up in the White House. The tethers in the White House. The tethers, the tethers, tethers in the White House. The tethers, the tethers, tethers in the White House. Bro, we did not need you to get up in the White House, bro. So I definitely don't think we needed you to get up in the country and make a name for ourselves and make a way for ourselves. Because you was up in the damn White House when you couldn't even go to McDonald's. Now listen. Listen, show some respect when you talk to the tethers. Show some respect when you talk to the Caribbeans. Show some respect when you talk to the Africans. Show some respect. Show some respect. Show some respect when you talk to the Africans. Show some respect when you talk to Caribbeans. <laughs> show some respect. Show some respect. Show some respect when you talk to the tethers. Show the respect, man. You better know better. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Nah, but on the real, though. On the real. On the real, man. On the real. The tethers made the black race look goddamn good the past 200 years, man. We made it look good, man. We made it look good. Despite any of our circumstances, when the camera was on us, we made it look good, man. Let's get back into it. Now on the screen, we got General Paul Magra paying an eight hour visit to Fisk University, as we know the HBCU in Nashville. During his US tour, Haitian President Paul Magra is presented an honorary doctorate of law degree by Fisk President Charles Johnson. Mayor Bain West also greeted Magra. Man, we was up in Chicago popping champagne. We was up in Fisk University getting honorary doctorate degrees. We was up in the White House having dinner with Richard Nixon. We was up in the White House having dinner with Dwight D. Eisenhower. Man, we was just, man, listen, listen, listen. The tethers was just moving through the city like we owned it. The tethers was just moving through the city mobbing like mob bosses. You dig what I'm saying? Checking our brothers, you know, checking our black American brothers. Like, what up, bro? We, we up in the city, bro. Where you at? You know what I'm saying? We up in the, yo, we chilling with the president. We chilling with the, with, the, with the Chicago defender. We chilling up in Chicago with the rich black man. You know what I'm saying? Listen, listen, we up with the black elite. With the, we with the white elite. We, yo, we, we yo. <laughs> Listen, listen, keep in mind, this is the 1950s, bro, when, you know, churches is getting bombed and people is getting abducted into the woods and people still getting hung from trees and people still getting lynched. Listen, this is major stuff. This is major stuff, bro. Major stuff, bro, that Tariq will never tell his audience because, like I said, he needs to sell T-shirts. Let's get back into it. Now on the screen, we got General Paul McGraw in the center. He is pictured here with the administration of President William Tubman, I believe. And this is the homies out in Liberia. This is the homies out in Liberia. You got to understand during this time, it was only three independent black heads of state at the time, right? The head of state of Ethiopia, the head of state of Liberia, and the head of state of Haiti. Everybody else was under colonization, exploitation, got their boot on their neck, got a foot up their butt. Everybody else was under colonization to the fullest degree. Liberia, Haiti, Ethiopia, the only place where the black man had some semblance of power and freedom over his daily life. Everybody else got a boot, a white boot up their butt. Let's get back into it. Pictured in this photo, you got General Paul McGraw, and then you got Vice President William Tolbert, I believe his name was. And as you can see, the brothers, you know, suited and booted as always. General Paul McGraw to the left. Then you got, you know, Vice President Tolbert in the center, you know, with the glasses. You know, and then you got the homies, the Liberian homies in the back. You know, I guess the armed guards in the army. You know what I'm saying? We got, you know, heads of state and diplomats flying in. You know, we got to have them well respected and well connected and well protected. You dig what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, look at the black man, you know, in his power, in his dignity, in his prime. You're talking about Pan-Africanism. You're talking about Liberia to the Caribbean. Yeah, man, we flying in. The brothers from Liberia flew into Haiti. We was popping champagne, smoking cigars with our women. And, yeah, Haitians came through to Liberia. We came to Liberia to visit our homies. And we came to Chicago to visit the black Americans. And we went to Cuba to visit the homies. And we went to 
Puerto Rico to visit the homies. We was flying all over the place visiting the homies, man. You talking about Pan Africanism? Then let's really talk about Pan Africanism. You charlatan. You con artist. You real estate scammer. You open a damn liquor store talking about it's a museum. Huh. Come on, man. Come on, man. Don't ever step to me talking about no damn Pan-Africanism. Talking about you lead the way. You do not lead nothing. You don't lead nothing, man. You don't lead nothing. And I'm, you know, I'm tired of being humble. I'm going to just say it, bro. Haitians got that title. All right. The honorable Haitian man, the black Haitian man is the, is the ultimate premier Pan-Africanist on the planet and has been for the past 20, 18 years. I'm stamping it. And if you have a problem with what I said, make your own video with as many examples that I put up. You can't. You won't. You'll never do it because it's impossible. Now, listen, up on the screen, I got the picture of General Paul Magloire seated with Richard Nixon. Now, this is not Pan-Africanism, but I just want to show the fact that the black man came through visiting the vice president of the United States, came through with the armed guards. You dig? Look at the black men in the back. You know what I'm saying? Well, we got like, you know, you know, a black men in the half in the back. You know, so we got like one black man. And, you know, I got like a half a black man to the left. And I don't know about the black man to the right. You know what I'm saying? But anyways, maybe that was I don't know. But anyways, listen, Paul McGuire came through with the armed guards. You know, the black. You know, so look at the black man came through. They probably was like, damn. Look how the black man came through dignified with his own armed security detail, bro. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Pan-Africanism. Let's get back. Let's get back. Now, listen, I've been here way too long. So, listen, to wrap it up, I'm going to just give y'all some photos from when President Papa Doc, a.k.a. Francois Duvalier, he welcomed President Haile Selassie from Ethiopia. He came through there, Haiti. And I'm going to show y'all some pictures from that meeting. You know, we're going to close out like that. I've been here damn near two hours running my damn mouth. You know what I'm saying? This is crazy. I haven't slept all night. You know what I mean? I got to get some sleep. Listen, get in the cash app right now. Listen, I didn't gave y'all. Listen, look at the gems I didn't gave y'all ever since I've been on YouTube, man. Listen, I love y'all so much. We're about to hit a thousand subscribers. It's crazy, man. I only been at it for like three months, really. Like two, three months. I've been at it consistently. And just like that, man, went from like 50 subscribers to damn near a thousand subscribers, man. Love y'all. I got nothing to say, man. Love y'all. Support your boy, man. Support your boy. Support your boy. You know I do this for free, man. You know I do this for free. You know you can't even get monetized until you hit like a thousand subscribers. So you know this has been just off the love, off the cuff. So please show your boy some love, man, because I didn't debunk these damn FBA goofballs. Now it's pretty much like a done deal, right? It's pretty much rest in peace, right? I pretty much rest in peace that other shit the other damn day with my rebuttal, my response, crushed her in that debate. Listen, debunked her, sent her back to the dustpan. And Tariq Nasheed, I sent him back to the dustpan so many times, man. How many times I got to send him back to the dustpan? Tariq, stop making me work, bro. You got to understand, I don't get paid for this, bro. I don't get paid for this. And every time you say some nonsense, I'll be trying to chill. But the ancestors tell me to go correct you. They tell me to go correct you. So I got to correct you. Just like the ancestors told me to go correct that chick from the other day who I gave a damn near over an hour debunking session. Fried her, cooked her, flambeed her, roasted her, baked her. Listen, and you, you get the same treatment. Listen, it's your boy Nefakari Desaline back in the building. Yes, yes, and then go on, peace. Reincarnated, I'm back in the original fashion. I left on a horse and came back in that ass, and I left with abundance and came back to famine. We used to be pyramids, now we be rapping. Look how the mighty have fought it. Used to be running, now we be walking. When you be cooning, that's when they applauded. Selling your soul, your sons and your daughter. Gotta come up in this shit. They stuck in the mix. Really, my heart to be breaking. That's why I'm stacking that paper and handle my business. Pass it down in generation. Talking about money and power and building a nation. That's a deadly combination. Never be watching the TV, they pushing the genders. Falsifying information. No, they got malice intentions. Step in the room and I'm feeling attention. Enemy watching me, blocking my vision. Pay for the check, cause I need my redemption. Building my kingdom, I need it protected. Ready for war like a young money Congo. Never decided the team is the motto. Up in the crib and I'm whipping up waffles. Up in the crib and I'm smoking gelato. I'm chilling, I'm taking my pain and making ambition. I'm blessed by the guys, but I ain't religious. I came for the power, they came for the bitch. They make no hourly wage. I got business. This shit is an art, and it can never be taught. Selling my soul, I can never be bought. Play with my money, I see you in court. Run to the check and I do it for sport Babylon falling, I go to the source Packing my luggage and go overseas Shorty be with me and she so at least Shorty be chosen, I'm calling her Hershey Secret intelligence probably gon' murder me Don't fuck with brands cause nigga I'm Haitian Say the wrong shit and you're smacking their faces